Dr. Sampat Patel from India will be uh, our moderator for this session. Um, a fantastic uh, surgeon and a very good friend uh, coming to us from India. Sampat, it's all yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, I'm going to invite uh, our presenters, uh, Dr. Nikesh Shah and, uh, and Dr. Uh, uh, Rahul Upadhyay. Uh, let me introduce both of them. Dr. Nikesh Shah is practicing foot and ankle surgeon from Vadodara, and uh, he is uh, past president of uh, Indian Foot and Ankle Society, uh, a learned person who is going to uh, present us few cases today. Uh, Dr. Rahul Upadhyay is young foot and ankle surgeon uh, from uh, uh, Jaipur, and um, he has also some interesting cases of uh, tendon injuries around ankle. So uh, over to you, Nikesh, sir. Uh, let us start uh, discussing some acute scenarios where uh, we are going to uh, discuss few uh, tendon injuries and soft tissue injuries around ankle. Okay. Am I audible, Sampat? Yes. Perfect. And uh, my screen is on? Yes, absolutely. Please. Okay. So good morning, everyone from India. Uh, it must be night uh, out there in the New York. So, hi, Selin. And we'll start with the uh, first case, which is tibialis anterior acute traumatic rupture with bony avulsion. So, our aim for the case is to discuss the different uh, injury patterns and management and how do we uh, manage the fixation. So, patient presented with the history of road traffic accident with uh, uh, acute uh, uh, pulling of the leg which was uh, stuck between the uh, in the body of the vehicle and so there was a sudden jerk on the ankle and he had uh, uh, closed foot injury without any open wound he presented with the difficulty in walking and uh, difficulty in uh, uh, in uh, walking and running and there was a swelling on the on the foot he came to the clinic by driving the car and walking on his own. He was not aware about the injury magnitude which we uh, anticipated and which he had. Uh, on examination, there was severe pain and swelling in the foot. Patient was unable to uh, dorsiflex the ankle and uh, uh, there was a on asking for the dorsiflexion, we could not see the uh, the popping of the tibialis anterior, which can be visible uh, while patient wants to dorsiflex. So we suspected some uh, tendon injuries, and uh, X-ray was taken, and the X-ray showed the uh, bony chip avulsion. So our suspicion was again strengthened. So these are the different views which suggest uh, evolution of the uh, tibialis anterior from its insertion with the bone chip. So we subjected the patient for the MRI scan on suspicion of the clinical diagnosis. And these are the few pictures of MRI which confirms the diagnosis of the tibialis anterior from its insertion. So these are the yeah. few pictures. And there was no other injury except the tibialis anterior. Hey, Nikesh, you may want to be hitting the next button on the bottom of your box because it's still on your um, title slide. So we have not seen any of the slides. Yes. Okay. If you hit next, okay. then we can follow you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so I will start from the... Yeah. So okay so this is the evolution of the tibialis anterior bony chip so dr nikesh uh, at, yes. at this juncture um, do you think that uh, uh, that evolution uh, from the uh, uh, the uh, middle aspect of uh, first cuneiform 
uh, is it the bony evolution of T very anterior? Hello, am I audible, Dr. Nikesh? Yes, yes. So uh, if we if we look at the insertion of the tibialis anterior and the location of the bony piece and the clinical uh, examination, which showed while, while patient was asked to dorsiflex the ankle, he was not able to. I, I mean, I was not able to palpate the contraction of the tibialis anterior. <clears throat> so collecting the all uh, clinical features in the radiology, we could suspect that there is a tibialis anterior injury. There could be associated injuries to the uh, dorsal tendons like uh, EHL or something, but which we could not, I mean, we, we could see the contraction of the tendon visibly while clinical examination. The TBRS posterior could be there, but it was also visible while we examined the patient clinically. He was able to show the contraction of the TBRS posterior. So this was the only and then which was not visible clinically functioning. And so we suspected the injury to the tibialis anterior. So in such cases, <laughs> clinical examination is uh, more important to decide the type of injury, the structure which are injured. Uh, yes, yes. Sir. Any role of uh, uh, sonography or ultrasound? Yes, absolutely. Sonography can be, uh, can be a very valuable diagnostic tool in uh, in foot and ankle injuries. If we have done the sonography, we could see the clear cut uh, gap between the insertion side of the tibialis anterior stump. And we can also see the, we can also see the, uh, the bony chip. Uh, we went for the MRI. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, there is no logic to why we didn't go for the sonography or MRI, but sonography is a, must diagnosis so that should be the take home message that in such cases sonography should be done first so that we have a uh, we have a proper uh, information before we go for the any procedure or the further investigation right okay so this is another view of the x-ray picture this is another, these are the views of the MRI. And so it was showing clear cut uh, evolution of the tibialis anterior. And the, there was no tendon pathology, tendon was healthy. So another uh, logic of getting the MRI is to show, is to know the, if there is any previous degeneration in the tendon or not. Like in case of the, uh, Tendo Achilles, if there is tendinopathy, then the whole management changes. But we, as it was a significant acute trauma injury, we were not suspecting any tendon pathology. And uh, so that was the reason why we preferred MRI over the sonography to know the intratendinous status, if there is any degeneration or pre-existing some anomaly is there or not. So we could see the uh, evolution of the tibialis anterior. So this is the uh, post-operative X-ray image uh, from the CA. And so we, so what we did is we went in, uh, we opened the, uh, from entry aspect, intermedial incision was taken and uh, the tendon was able with the bony chip uh, and it was retracted proximally. So we opened it. Uh, debrided the tendon and uh, we advanced the insertion to the medial cuneiform and fixed there with the one suture anchor in the medial cuneiform and uh, the tendon was repaired. So there was a combination with the uh, in the medial cuneiform so we did not use that bone so that to have a very good fixation and yes. uh, we could achieve the proper tensioning of the tendon and uh, we were satisfied with the decision of uh, putting the anchor in the middle cuneiform. Actually, it is interesting because tiberis anterior has quite wide insertion on the 
medial aspect of cuneiform and also the base of the metatarsal which is quite plantar and medial because when yeah. we insert the plate for the medial column of lis frank or midfoot injuries we do see this insertion and we do slide the plate under the tibialis anterior or protect the tibialis anterior at that time and um, uh, avulsing it through all that attachment is really a significant force uh, applied yes. at that so, time. so in these situations we need to uh, we need to elicit the history properly and that can give a very good clue regarding the extent of the injury so patient's leg was out of the vehicle and he fell down so there was a sudden huge pull uh, including the whole body weight and uh, fall from the uh, vehicle two wheeler so his leg was stuck in the vehicle body so there was a sudden pull and that has caused the such a great uh, uh, injury such a severe injury normally yes. we don't see such uh, injuries of the isolated tibialis anterior and it's a healthy so tendon so like, yes. like yes. acl healthy it has, yeah it has avulsed through the bone and then it is easy for bone to come back and heal in position yes but there was as you can see from this image there was a combination in the uh, and uh, bony chips were there from in the medial cuneiform so we suspect that we will not have a good hold of the anchor in the medial, medial cuneiform. So we had to uh, look for the another insertion and we went for the medial cuneiform. Right. Uh, so this is the function after two years. We can easily see the uh, contraction of the tibialis anterior. Uh, it is very visible. What was your post-op protocol uh, when you did the yes. repair? Yes. So, as there was a combinated fracture in the med medial cuneiform and the severe tendon injuries, we kept the posterior splint for four weeks. After four weeks, patient was allowed to mobilize the ankle. And after uh, eight weeks, he was allowed to wait wear with the neutral brace with the ankle in the neutral position and uh, after three weeks of that the brace was removed and patient was asked to walk unaided so this was the post-op protocol which followed okay. so these are the functions after two years okay Thank you. We have seen we have seen tibialis anterior injury through uh, substance of the tendon, but it is unusual to get it from uh, from the bone. Yes, yes, yes. Can you go for the next case, sir? Sure. So this is again tibialis anterior uh, case. So patient was a diabetic and they came with the complaint of difficulty in walking and uh, on examination there was no clinical visible contraction of the tibialis anterior. We could not see the tibialis anterior uh, acting and patient was having difficulty in dorsiflexion while dorsiflexion he was using uh, extensor tendons of the toes so it was a weak uh, extensor. Uh, and dorsiflexion of the ankle and uh, so we suspected there is a uh, injury to the tibialis anterior and as patient was also diabetic so these are the clinical picture while patient presented to us and as you can see he was not able to dorsiflex strongly and properly and there was no visible uh, contraction of the tibialis anterior.
so yes we did sonography in this uh, patient and we can see the the empty space of the tibialis anterior and we could not see the tibialis anterior tendon and so there is a buckling of the uh, tendon proximally and it was a discontinuity and was there any history of trauma in this case uh, it was a very trivial trauma just while walking at the home uh, he had some he fumbled and he fell down without any major injuries and uh, he was wearing the rubber slippers so it, i mean he must have fumbled because of some transient ischemic attack he he did not slip so his foot was stuck in the ground and he fell down but he he didn't have any other injuries except the pain in the ankle on the entry aspect so this patient was explained regarding the repair of the tendon and everything but he did not wanted surgery because he was afraid of the his diabetic status which was uncontrolled and he could walk with some difficulty so he he didn't opted for the surgery and we tried to explain him regarding the peak dorsiflexors and the uh, difficulty in walking in but we could not convince him and his diabetes was also uncontrolled so he was also worried about the infection so he did not wanted surgery and was treated uh, conservatively and uh, presently he is walking with a limp and so he is also wearing a splint Pardon. any dis uh, disability um, of any uh, neuropathy um, neuropathy other than yes uh, yes we can see the uh, we can see some trophic changes on in the toes so definitely there was a peripheral neuropathy affecting the foot and we could see the trophic changes in the toes and this uh, skin so definitely there were changes of uh, Uh, neuropathy right thanks so as you said is... as you rightly said the sonography is very important diagnostic tool for such cases which is inexpensive less ready i mean no radiation and we could gather the proper information uh, with the sonography also which will help in our management sonography has a very good role in foot and ankle uh, surgery it's a dynamic tool and we need to go ourselves to um, uh, evaluate the condition it helps in management as well it's a dynamic tool so you can see how much gap closure is possible how much is the retraction what is the site of tendon injury you can mark it even pre operatively so that your incision is minimized this is particularly uh, helpful in achilles tendon injuries where uh most of the times what i do is uh in achilles acute achilles tendon injuries how i decide about the management is uh you see the quality of tendon you see the level of tendon which is ruptured and then you also see how much gap closure is possible in that uh, particular case so depending on that you can decide if it is degenerated tendon what you need to do intraoperatively whether i am going to do the uh, debridement or i am going to do the uh, uh, direct repair where should i place the incision so all these uh, things can be uh, looked by yourself uh, with sonography it's a dynamic tool so i mean just for the sake of my knowledge sampad what could be the uh limitations of sonography in foot and ankle uh, cases uh, on the contrary uh, in uh, uh, tendon injuries particularly sometimes mri may show some magic effect particularly in uh, peroneal tendons but sonography is very helpful to uh, evaluate those tendon injuries uh, because it's a dynamic tool you can see yourself you can make the patient uh, uh do the active movements 
and uh, evaluate yourself. Uh, okay. Only, yeah, only limitation is probably uh, some deep uh, ligaments uh, associated injuries may be missed. So alone, this tool uh, may not help you. Of course, you need to correlate with the uh, MRI findings also. Okay, and. Uh... Can we can we look for the tendinopathies or tendinosis with the sonography? Is it possible to? Absolutely. In diagnosis? fact, uh, a, a quality of tendon can be looked for. The fibrillar pattern, which is uh, very well appreciated on sonography, tells you whether that is arranged nicely or it is a degenerated tendon or there is a calcification in the tendon, which can be picked up earlier than X-ray. Uh, most important is the inflammatory changes. Sometimes these people are liable to uh, get these ruptures uh, uh, even in inflammatory conditions. Like we have discussed oh. in diabetes, it is also possible that some inflammatory conditions, autoimmune or pseudonegative um, arthritis or autoimmune conditions, these uh, tendons or soft tissues are liable for ruptures. So many times we have seen that inflame uh, the if you put on the Doppler effect uh, on that uh, tendon, you will see the local inflammatory pathology before even okay. tendon ruptures, and it is very well seen in Achilles particularly. So that yeah. time you can anticipate that this is not a healthy tissue. You may need to, if at all it has ruptured, you may need to debride it and be ready for some augmentation procedure or some tendon transfers okay and so like in in our uh, uh, in our setup we uh, usually go for the sonography plus mri so what could be the complementary uh, are they complementary to each other or is it just we are spending unnecessarily no absolutely uh, so usd is a uh, uh, subjective tool so if it is used correctly and particularly with the inputs of surgeon, then probably it helps in a greater way. Of course, as I said, uh, some uh, deeper structures cannot be evaluated and um, they will need uh, MRI uh, for sure. But yeah. you need to uh, you need to correlate both the findings. Yeah. So what we uh, I mean, why I prefer MRI including i mean plus the sonography is we could see the tendinosis changes better with mri yes. the intra substance changes we can see in a better way so that we can decide the plan of management if the tendon is diseased then we may have to debride it extensively and we have to go for the tendon grafting or something if it is needed so that way we use the mri to know the tendon status so that's why we go for the uh, sonography and if patient is ready for the surgery then pre-operatively we always go for the mri to know the tendon status right. so that is what we follow i mean sonography is a diagnostic tool and uh, mri as a pre-operative investigation which can give some additional information so, i mean that is how we can use optimally the investigations and uh, control the unnecessary spending of the patient any input from you rahul yes sir, i think you uh, have to unmute one uh, limitation uh, am i audible i think i should be audible yes yes, yes. yeah so i think one one important limitation of uh, an ultrasound here is that it is uh, quite subjective and it depends a lot on the investigator. So I think a good MSK radiologist uh, can do wonders with the ultrasound, but at the same time, someone with a limited experience and limited exposure to it might not be able to give us as much amount of information as we need with an ultrasound. So therefore the MRA has an edge over it where we can you know, uh, get a better image uh, and uh, uh, we, we ourselves can read them. Uh, at the same time, if we look especially in the peroneal area where, where the tendons are uh, hidden within the uh, groove of the uh, of the fibula, uh, 
there the especially the magic angle effect of mri make, makes it difficult to identify those injuries and uhg uh, being a, a, a dynamic modality we can uh, you know uh, see those tendons moving out of the groove and we can uh, help to uh, find out the tendon defects the tears the intersubstantial tears or longitudinal splits sometime so i guess both of both these modalities have their roles to play and uh, but yes, I'm a, a UHG is definitely a brilliant tool if, if it is done in the right hand. Yeah. So in India, we have the limitation of not keeping the sonography in our clinic because of the, uh, you know, PCP and DT Act. So that is the main limiting factor for us orthopedic surgeon. We cannot keep the sonography. I mean, it's a very tedious job to keep a sonography with uh, everywhere. So even if it is an inexpensive tool, it is not in our hand. We are dependent on the radiologist. And the radiologist is far away. We just cannot go and have a dynamic look. So that is the main limiting factor for sonography in our country. So we have to be dependent on the good MSK radiologist, as you rightly said, Rahul. Whereas in MRI, we can see the uh, uh, we can see the pictures and we can have the good uh, uh, delineation of the soft tissues and everything uh, by our own. Whereas in sonography, we are dependent on the radiologists in India. We just cannot hold the probe and do the sonography. Either we have to go to their clinic, and which is definitely not uh, possible practically. So this is the main limitation in India we have. We cannot just keep the sonography machine at our clinic. So this is a very important message to all the even international delegates. Although we prefer sonography, but personally we just cannot uh, uh, hold the probe of the sonography and do the USD. So that is the main limiting factor of using the sonography. Yes. Should we go for the another case? Yes, sir. Yes. So this is a case of uh, peroneal tendon. So he is a male 45 active overweight person who came with history of sudden twisting of the ankle. X-ray of the ankle was reported as normal and uh, he was treated as ankle sprain with raised ice application, compression bandage and elevation and oral medications. And uh, patient was sent home. He came for follow-up with, uh, uh, with partial improvement. He was not able to take rest due to his uh, job. He didn't take the injury seriously. And uh, as he was able to walk, he was walking and he was doing all his duties with some pain and uh, taking oral medication. Uh, so he continued walk, walking with the pain and taking the analgesic. And uh, so there was persistent pain. He Okay. So he came with the persistent pain. So MRI was done and which showed the peroneal tendon dislocation. So there was no tear when we went for the MRI. The patient was again explained the regarding the severity of the uh, injury. But uh, he just didn't uh, wanted to uh, go for any further procedure or investigation. So he came again follow up uh, after three weeks of MRI, which showed the peroneal tendon dislocation. He came again walking with pain and mild limb. And the repeat X-ray was showing some flag of the bone at the lateral mellulus. So we suspected that it's a peroneal tendon, traumatic peroneal tendon dislocation. And uh, we could not 
elicit the dislocation because of the pain. So clinically, it was not possible to elicit the peroneal tendon dislocation. And we clinically suspected that uh, peroneal tendon dislocation on MRI also. And uh, on X-ray now, it was showing the very faint bone chip. So uh, the tendon was intact on the MRI. The patient again came after three weeks of the MRI for surgery because now he was not able to walk properly. The pain was increasing surprisingly. And so he came after three weeks of the MRI and he came for the surgery. So we uh, we planned the surgery and we were planning to uh, open and repair the Ebel's peroneal retinaculum. And so this was the status at the time of uh, opening. As you can see, the so on exploration, yeah. tendon was ruptured. As you can it see, the, the yeah, it is running in my PC. OK. One would are you able to see? Uh, it's not running here. One video is running. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. we're not seeing it uh, move. So in my PC, it is running. So how can I? I'm I'm seeing it as a running video. Yeah, I don't know, um, Matt. If you have any suggestions. Dr. Nikesh, till then, uh, when you have taken X-rays, uh, uh, do you think that even standing axial views are important in? Peronial? It's running now, by the way. Sorry, guys. It's running. Yeah. Okay. So there must be yeah. some lag because of the internet. Is it running now? Yes. I think I have clicked both of the videos are running. Yes, Sampath. Yes, so uh, when, you took, yeah, when you took x-rays, do you think that even standing yes. axial views are important in some... Uh, some yes, so, yes. so this was a great learning for us. We, we took the x-ray in a normal position, AP and lateral view, and uh, it was reported as normal. We could not see any bony injuries uh, on the x-ray. Even on follow-up also, the x-ray showed faint bony chip. So, you know, the uh, to know the peroneal retinaculum evolution with the bony chip, we need to have a proper view, which can show the fibula in different angles. Otherwise, it can easily be missed because it's on the posterior aspect. So, if our clinical suspicion is not good, then we may miss such injuries. So, this was a great learning for us. And if clinically we are suspecting the bony chip evolution or some peroneal tendon dislocation, then we need to take few oblique views of the fibula to know the uh, status of the bony chip injury. Also, so as um, you can, we have seen, yeah we have seen that people who have uh, varus at the hind foot, hind, hind foot or heel varus, uh, then you see a standing axial view these people are predisposed to get these peroneal tendon lesions or acute injuries because of twisting injuries. And um, if you do alone the peroneal tendon repair, probably uh, uh, we need to add some calcaneal slide osteotomy or something to correct the varus because otherwise then um, patient is again predisposed to have uh, the strain on the repair or uh, the re-rupture. Yes. So, okay. So, regarding this uh, patient, on exploration tendon was ruptured, which was a surprise for us also. And we suspected that uh, while patient was walking uh, with unaided, the tendon must have rubbed against the uh, raw surface of the fibula, and which has caused the traumatic rupture. You can also see the fray fraying of the tendon ends uh, on the video, and there was a gap which we could not uh, fill with the even with the pulling of the tendon so we had to go for the tendon graft 
and we use the palmaris longus as tendon graft because of its thickness which matches with the peroneal tendon so uh, palmaris longus was harvested on table patient was uh, explained and consent was taken because we were not suspecting tendon rupture and both the tendons were injured so we had to take the consent intraoperatively explaining the patient and the relatives patient was under spinal anesthesia and uh, we had to look, take the tendon graft on the palmaris longus and tendon was the repair was attempted so there was a big gap Okay. So as you can see, while taking the suture, we use the proline three zero, and as you can see, the the suture broke while taking the knot. So this is also important lesson we learned that we have to be very cautious while tightening, and we have to use the strong suture material in such cases wherein the gap is expected and we had to uh, oppose the tendon ends even if with the tendon graft the 30 proline was broke so we had to use now fiber wire 20 to get a proper stronger repair so are you able to see the video as you can see the the thread broke and then we Sampad, are you able to see the video? Actually, video so is not is seen. The... But it is fine. Probably there must be a lag. I wanted to ask uh, if um, the palmaris longus, uh, do you find the mismatch between the diameter because the caliber of peroneus uh, and the palmaris longus must be uh different so did you do a single uh, graft there or a kind of double uh, loop what did you do there yes so as you can see i mean uh, we were also planning to repair the peroneal groove and the peroneal sheath so if we use the some larger tendon uh, which is larger than the peroneal then there will be some difficulty in repairing the peroneal sheath and the dislocation might continued so we opted for the tendon which is having less diameter which can be easily accommodated in the peroneal groove so this was a decision taken for uh, peroneal i mean palmaris longus graft that was the logic of us i mean if you use the other tendon like semi tendinous or something then the, it will have a larger diameter than the peroneal tendon so as you can see the thickness of the tendon graft is almost similar to the uh, the peroneal tendon and peroneal retinaculum was also repaired uh, in this patient so brevis was repaired with 20 fiber wire loop and peroneal ten, uh, retinaculum was repaired with the four set of sutures on the edge of the lateral medulla is video running properly because in my pc it is running okay not seen here probably some lag and what was the post of audio audio visual people uh, do something i mean my connection is fast enough i would say what was your post of protocol in this case sir so we kept the splint in the, in the eversion for 3 weeks and after that we started mobilizing and allowed the patient to wait there after 6 weeks and functionally he was better uh, there was no uh, difficulty in walking or no pain or something and after say around 3 months he was walking on aid okay. but again a point to be stressed is in these patients do see uh, various of the hind foot and uh, if possible uh, know it by axial uh, standing views as well of course clinically if you suspect varus do see the uh, hind foot uh, uh, pathology yes
Are you able to see the video now? Uh, probably not. Let okay. see. I mean, because this is very. I mean, I just wanted to emphasize a very good point here, but I'm. The video is running on my side. Okay, that's fine. Sir. Then we'll... fine. Okay. Yes, now it is running. Sir. Oh. <laughs> Now is it running? Uh, I think we'll skip it, sir, because uh, it okay. is taking. So the lesson learned: reassessment yeah. is always needed when you have not seen the patient for a few weeks before the surgery. I mean, this is also common in Western setup, wherein patients are given. I mean, patient come for the surgery after say few weeks. Uh, so reassessment is always so preoperative reassessment of the patient immediately preoperatively is very much needed to know the what is what has happened in between the period and strong suture material is always preferred and be ready to use the tendon graft in case of gap rather than pulling and suturing the tendon under tension Okay. Thank you, Sampath. The next case is of uh, Dr. Rahul. Dr. Rahul, can you present? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sampath, sir. So, uh, so this is an interesting case. So we had a 28-year-old male who sustained this open injury to his right foot in a road traffic accident. He was managed at a district hospital near the hospital primarily. And since it was an open injury, a roadside accident, there was a lot of uh, uh, contamination. So a primary debridement was done uh, at, the prim uh, at the primary center where they had to remove a lot of uh, uh, distal stump of the extensor tendons. Interestingly, this patient also had a history of uh, bilateral ACL reconstruction being done. So both the hamstring graft have, have already been used for this patient. So this was uh, uh, the condition when he presented to us. If you see, uh, I could isolate all the tendons there on table and uh, try to look up all the stumps that were available to us for the repair. So this was the uh, a string for yeah. second and video third is not, uh, no. digits, the ideal. No, it is still not playing. It must be played uh, playing in your PC, but here we are not able to see. That was also happening with me. Can audiovisual guy help in this? Yeah. Well, uh, with me. Yeah. So video is running in I our think there PC. There is a lag but... in the uh, video transmission. No, there is. It is not running at all. There is no lag. It is simply not running. So this is a technique, I think. I think Raul, what you can do is uh, click the next button. So again, I think have, then it's the... click the next button on the bottom. Yes, now it is playing. Now we are able to see. Yeah, I did. Yeah, so yes. now we are able to see. Okay. Yes. So just by so now, uh, clicking on playing. not it is not playing. Now we are able to see. This is So this is where we are exploring all the tendons here. So we, we just had a part of the digital stump available uh, to us. Uh, a large uh, segment in between had gone uh, because it was divided uh, primarily. I think. So yes. Click the next button so once, and it will play. Uh, 
don't click and on the play and icon and just so click on click the next once we, we were able to isolate all the tenants yes so once we we had explored the digital stumps uh, we started exploring for the proximal uh, stump that was available at the edl so this was the proximal stump of the edl that was available very fine uh, a thin sheet of uh, thin flimsy edl segment was available but there was a long and a huge gap between the available uh, tendon fragments that we had and uh, as i said uh, we had issues with the tendon graph and uh, we could not use the hamstring which could have been a good graph ideal graph for this thing so the only thing which was left avail available to us was to do a turn down of the same tendon same edl tendon sheet that was available so this is what we did so the, what we did is we, we split the EDL tendon uh, into half and we turned it down. And at the same time, we did a side-to-side -side repair of all the extensor tendons of the digit and made them uh, a single unit to combine with the same tendon. So this was the only thing left, only option left with us to repair uh, the this tendon defect. So once we had done this thing, uh, this repair was not a very strong repair because the tendon uh, fragment available with us was very thin and we had to keep this patient protected for a longer duration so we did not allow a, a weight bearing uh, for this patient for a period of around 12 weeks for eight weeks this patient was in a cast a below knee cast and after eight weeks we shifted this, this patient from cast uh, to an ankle foot orthosis so this was his uh, functional movement nearly six months after the primary repair was done. Because you see there is some amount of extensor lag at the uh, IP joint, but still uh, our primary aim with this patient while, uh, while uh, repairing this tendon defect was to make sure that he does not develop much of a cloying because of the overpull of the flexor tendons. So so there's a question in these think, repairs uh, do you use some form of we were able barrier to, that to prevent scar tissue adhesions do you guys use any kind of adhesion barrier to prevent scar tissue adhesions for these repairs no i have not used but you have any experience of using any material which can prevent this scar formation no actually we just uh, do some uh, uh, pulley reconstruction to avoid bow stringing but really i have not used any material to avoid the scarring Salin, do you use some material can you can you Salin, could you please uh, repeat that question i lost you yeah, the question was whether or not you use any kind of material to prevent scar formation in the repairs. Um, and the reason for that question is, at least in, so in the U.S. I have personally not used uh, only the... I'm sorry, go ahead, Raul. Uh, so I was just about to say that we uh, I use whatever uh, ex uh, the retinaculum the extensor retinal was left for me to cover up this tendon so that we could prevent the scarring and the bowstring of this tendon uh, because a lot of amount of the fat and everything else was already uh, lost to this injury so we had no other uh, substance to you know uh, prevent scarring here I I'm not sure whether you have something available in the U.S. for yeah. this. I so I think the reason why that. this person probably asked the question is in the U.S. we do have availability to amniotic tissue products or uh, a collagen seaweed based product um, and both of those have some properties of uh, decreasing scar formation and adhesion formation so i think that's why somebody was asking yeah so these are all the challenging issues of open compound injuries uh, wherein we have very less tissue available for the reconstruction so this bundling of uh, the uh, tendons because EHL and EDL is uh, uh, 
uh, is united at the knot of Henry. So we can always bundle all the tendons and uh, repair it uh, with the in-between tendon graft. So this is a very important uh, point to be taken for us uh, who are dealing with the open injuries, crush injuries, when we have very less tissue available for the restructuring. Compared, uh, how do you manage such uh, extensive tendon injuries? Actually, uh, our main issue is, uh, like Kirby uh, said, sir, has access to all the allografts all the time. Uh, we don't have uh, some allografts available, particularly tendon uh, allografts to bridge these uh, large gaps. So in lower limbs, what I do is uh, in same, if you uh, extend the pentium tripping up till knee, probably crassilis uh, rather than semiti, crassilis has some this thing, but as in his case, uh, it was already obtained for ACL, but probably crassilis is little uh, thinner tendon than semiti. Uh, autografts is the only, uh, I think, uh, option for us where allografts are not available. Okay. So is there any role of uh, doing free flap for the time being and going through the flap after a few weeks for the proper repair of the tendon rather than going afresh in such cases, Rahul? So I think this patient, we could easily cover the wound. Uh, I okay. think the skin cover was not a major issue in this patient. So so we have not done any flap or something for this. This was a primary closure that we were able to get. And uh, also this was not a tense closure. So we were uh, quite comfortable in that sense. But yes, in case there is an issue with the primary closure, uh, then we definitely, uh, the other option is we can use a back dressing or then or you could go, go for a, uh, free flap primarily and then do a delayed repair of the tendons. Okay, and how do you prevent bow stringing in such cases? Uh, as we, we were discussing, we have again, uh, like while we were talking about the bow stringing, we, we had some amount of retinaculum still left with us to cover the, that tendon, and we were able to do that. I think that is very essential uh, to prevent the bow stringing. So, so you use whatever amount of retinaculum left with you, and then you can you you can cover it. Yeah. Any other local tendon you would have thought of? I mean, uh, some uh, extensor hollis brevis or some extensor tendons, local tendons, rather than uh, going to the. Uh, is there any local tendons you would have thought of as a graft? Yes. Uh, see, we could have used uh, as a graft. We could. I thought of using uh, a, a sling from e even the peronia, but again, I did not want to add, uh, add to the morbidity of the same foot or uh, you know touch the other foot which was already normal. So uh, this was the easiest option uh, which was available, right? Uh, through the same incision where you don't have to extend things also. And uh, with the experience of using a turn down procedure for the tendo Achilles, I think we have we have all of us have seen some good amounts of success with that tendon. So I think that that was one possible explanation why I chose this tendon over uh, adding to any other tendon or morbidity to the patient. That's the reason we did not go for even the primary graft over there. Right. And uh, uh, so we have covered uh, peroneal tendons. We have covered tibialis anterior avulsion as well as uh, mid-substance uh, uh, rupture of tibialis anterior. Uh, my uh, question to uh, Nikesh sir, when you saw it uh, that uh, there was initially dislocation, but later on you found out to be rupture, could side-to-side -side, uh, tenodesis to the peroneus brevis uh, you would have thought yeah. of other than yeah. putting a, yeah. a tendon. So graft. both the tendons were ruptured somewhere. Okay. Both the tendons were. So if I am given the control, I can see, I can show the video right now. Okay. And uh, do you think that it was only because of dislocation they were ruptured, uh, or any? Yes. So uh, the uh, the chronology the event, I would I would reiterate that. Uh, the 
uh, I mean, patient came for the first uh, uh, as a part of the injury. At that time, MRI was done after three weeks of the injury, and it was normal. So okay. after the MRI, patient was advised surgery, and uh, the uh, patient was walking. He came after three weeks of the surgery, and so we suspected that while he was walking with the laceration of the tendons against rubbing by rubbing against the rough uh, fibular tip it would have uh, gone for the rupture rather than acute rupture so this was a you can say uh, gradual rupture and it must have given way after some time so at the time of initial presentation it was not uh, there so this is the video which i can show that the Proline 30 was used and it just got, yeah, so it just broke. And then we use the fiber wire and again repair. You can see the tendon graft in between. So this was an interesting case in, in a manner that when patient came after three to four weeks of the investigation and the surgery, we have to reassess the injury again. Otherwise, we could get such surprises. Right. And as you can see, the. So do you think chronic ankle instability has any role to play in? Yes, definitely. Chronic ankle instability would also predispose to such injuries. Particularly in this patient, uh, it was acute injury, and the surprisingly, the ankle ligament was found normal even on MRI and even on the exploitation. So there was no ligament injury in this patient. So, thank you, sir. Uh, we, we have discussed um, other than Achilles because Achilles in itself is a uh, big top topic. Uh, but uh, in in short, uh, because we have two three minutes left, uh, Nikesh has sir, acute Achilles ruptures. Uh, what is your protocol? Do you uh, observe? Do you go for? Uh, so we uh, yeah. So we categorically didn't show the uh, Achilles uh, tendon cases, right? Because it is very well discussed. Uh, so we wanted to have some cases which are not commonly uh, seen. So that was the reason of uh, selecting such cases. In acute uh, Achilles tendon injuries, we decide the plan according to the patient's age, his activity level, his demands, and the uh, associated medical conditions and the local skin condition. So if patient is sedentary, more than seven, 65 to 70 years of age, not uh, uh, looking for the sports activity or any strenuous activity, then he can very well be treated conservatively. In conservative treatment, what we do is we keep the foot in equinus for three, uh, three to four weeks and gradually we go on going for the dorsiflexion and uh, extensive rehab protocol is followed. And if patient is having sufficient, uh, uh, sufficient uh, power for the uh, walking and uh, normal activity, then he can be very well managed conservatively. If patient is young, active, who wants to have a uh, proper uh, push of the tendon tendo actualis for his uh, daily activity, then definitely we have to go in and repair it end to end. But always we uh, go for the MRI before the surgery to know the if there is any pre-existing uh, tendinopathy or tendon pathology. And uh, in most of the cases with acute rupture, with trivial trauma, we, found, we find uh, tendinopathy in the tendoachilis tendon. So if tendon is normal, then we go for the end-to-end -end repair with a strong suture material like fiber wire. Uh, we normally, we open it and uh, we, we go for the end-to-end -end repair. If end-to-end -end repair is not possible, if the injury is late, if the gap between the two 
tendon end is more than 4 to 5 cm and we are not able to close it without tension then we can go for the few reconstructive procedures like turn down or the uh, but in our setup we go for the direct fhl transfer well, guys, this was a fantastic session on some really difficult cases. So thank you for sharing that. Um, you. you know, the one thing to learn is a lot of times these are not controlled environments. So to see the kind of work you guys are doing is, is fantastic. Thanks for the pearls. Yeah. Thank Thanks, Celine. Thank you so much.